The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You'll hear a telephone conversation. Now you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, Country Comfort Albury. Oh, hi. I'd like some information, please. I'd like to find a double room to stay for the weekend. What kind of rooms do you have? Well, we provide a variety range of accommodation depending upon your likes. The guest house room costs $45 per night. It provides air conditioning and shower. And a waterfront room costs $80 per night. It has got its own balcony overlooking the foreshore of the lake. And we've got a kid. How do you charge for children? Extra bedding is available if you require that. If the kid is aged 12 and below, the cost is $10 per night for the guest house room and $15 for the waterfront room. Do you have a swimming pool, tennis court or something like that? Yes, we've got a swimming pool, which is free for all the guests. But the tennis court charges $8 each hour, including the rent of rackets. How about other facilities? We provide free off-street car parking and internet access. We also installed in-house movies, but that costs $4 per hour. Oh, we don't think we need that, because of the kid, you know. We don't want him to see movies on the weekend. Well, we also offer ironing equipment in the room. That's useful, I think. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to go through the questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the last part of the conversation and answer questions 7 to 10. Great! Could you tell me the address? How do we get there? Yes, it's Country Comfort Albury, A-L-B-U-R-Y, at 648 Dean Street, New South Wales. 648 Dean Street, D-E-A-N, is that right? Yes. Well, I wonder what activities are available there in this season. You know, we want to have an indulgent weekend in the boring winter. Oh, you'll not get bored here. You know, Albury is the perfect base for alpine skiing. Besides that, winter's frosty alpine air encourages walks through mist-laden valleys. You can walk alongside rushing streams and waterfalls. After returning to the warm and comfortable lounge, you can sit by the open fire. I think this is the ideal time of year to nourish your body at the Salus Spa. The idea of skiing doesn't appeal to me very much, but it sounds good to have a relaxing walk through the valleys. Maybe after that, I'll have a massage and some soaking in the spa. And you know, this hotel is perfectly located in a quiet position off the main highway in central Albury. It's within walking distance of licensed clubs, restaurants, shops and the central business district. It's known for its excellent cuisine and warm Australian hospitality. Good. It's a good idea to taste the tasty dishes in one of the restaurants. My wife may be interested in shopping. She's always keen on that. I think I'll contact you later. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. 
you will hear two students discussing a project they have to do as part of a literature course on great books. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? I heard you were sick. Oh, hi, Olivia. Yeah, I had a virus last week, and I missed a whole pile of lectures, like the first one on the great books in literature, where Dr. Castle gave us all the information about the semester project. I can give you copies of the handouts. I've got them right here. But that's okay. I already collected the handouts, but I'm not very clear about all the details. I know we each have to choose an individual author. I think I'm going to do Carlos Castaneda. I'm really interested in South American literature. Have you checked he's on the list that Dr. Castle gave us? We can't just choose anyone. Yeah, I checked. It's okay. Who did you choose? Well, I was thinking of choosing Ernest Hemingway, but then I thought, no, I'll do a British author, not an American one. So I chose Emily Bronte. Okay. And first of all, it says we have to read a biography of our author. I guess it's okay if we just look up information about him on the Internet? No, it's got to be a full-length book. I think the minimum length's 250 pages. There's a list of biographies. Didn't you get that? Oh, right. I didn't realize we had to stick with that. So what do we have to do when we've read the biography? Well, then we have to choose one work by the writer. Again, it's got to be something quite long. We can't just read a short story. But I guess a collection of short stories would be okay? Yes, or even a collection of poems, they said. But I think most people are doing novels. I'm going to do Wuthering Heights. I've read it before, but I really want to read it again now I've found out more about the writer. And then the video. We have to make a short video about our author and about the book. How long has it got to be? A minute. What? Like 60 seconds? And we got to give all the important information about their life and the book we choose? <laughs> well, you can't do everything. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes, Dr. Castle said we had to find or write a short passage that helps to explain the author's passion for writing, why they're a writer. So we can back this up with reference to important events in the writer's life, if they're relevant. But it's up to us, really. The video's meant to portray the essence of the writer's life and the piece of writing we choose. So when we read the biography, we have to think about what kind of person our writer is. Yes, and the historical context and so on. So for my writer, Emily Bronte, the biography gave a really strong impression of the place where she lived and the countryside around. Right. I'm beginning to get the idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Uh, can I check the other requirements with you? Sure. The handout said after we'd read the biography, we had to read the work we'd chosen by our author and choose a passage that's typical in some way, that typifies the author's interests and style. Yes, but at the same time, it has to relate to the biographical extract you choose, there's got to be some sort of theme linking them. Okay, I'm with you. And then you have to think about the video. So are we meant to dramatize the scene we choose? I guess we could, but there's not a lot of time for that. I think it's more how we can use things like sound effects to create the atmosphere, 
the feeling we want. And presumably visuals as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, I suppose that's the whole point of making a video. But whatever we use has to be historically in keeping with the author. We can use things like digital image processing to do it all. So we can use any computer software we want? Sure. And it's important that we use a range, not just one software program. That's actually one of the things we're assessed on. Okay. Oh, and something else that's apparently really important is to keep track of the materials we use and to acknowledge them. Including stuff we download off the internet, presumably? Yeah, so our video has to list all the material used with details of the source in a bibliography at the end. Okay, and you were talking about assessment of the project. Did they give us the criteria? I couldn't find anything on the handout. Sure, he gave us them in the lecture. Let's see, you get 25% just for getting all the components done. That's both sets of reading and the video. Then the second part is actually how successful we are at getting the essence of the work. They call that content, and that counts for 50%. Then the last 25% is on the video itself, the artistic and technical side. Great. Well, that sounds a lot of work, but a whole lot better than just handing in a paper. Thanks a lot, Olivia. You're welcome. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi Brad. I was wondering if you have time to answer some of my questions about my upcoming test. Sure, no problem Jeff. What is it that you're having problems on? Well, it's for my English final. We have to prepare a five-minute speech to present in front of the whole class, including the professor so I'm a little bit worried. Is there any specific topic, or can you do it on whatever you want? It has to have something to do with the origins of English literature. I'm thinking of doing it on Shakespeare, but I bet many other students will have the same idea. That's fine. Don't worry if others are doing the same thing. As long as you do a good job, that's all that counts. A good professor will grade all students fairly. You really think so? I suppose Shakespeare is the most famous author, so it should be fine. Besides, Shakespeare has so many works. You only have to choose a couple of them and talk about those. I guess you're right. Do you have any advice about how to prepare a speech? First, you need to select your topic. Have you done this yet? Yes, I have lots of information on Shakespeare. Good. Next, you should do a research on a specific topic. Do you have a deadline for which to turn in your speech topic? The deadline is next Tuesday. So you should have a detailed outline of what you will say by then. Do not just turn in a piece of paper saying Shakespeare on it. That will not give your professor any ideas to what you will be talking about. OK. So you think I should write out an outline of my speech? Of course! Writing your speech out in outline form is essential. No one could give a speech from scratch. Even the president must refer to his outline when giving a speech. An outline will give you a good structure to base your speech on. Now look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen to the tape and answer questions 26 to 30. That's true. I was thinking that I would do an outline last, after I figured everything out. But I think your idea is better. What should I do after I have an outline prepared? You should then write the speech out, word for word, what you're going to say. This is so you'll have a firm idea of what you will say. It doesn't mean that the speech you will give will be exactly the same, but at least you have a fairly good idea what the final product will be. At this point, I can read it over for you if you want. Really? That would be great. I would appreciate that so much. No problem. Once you write it out, the next step is to practice giving the speech. At first, you can do it in front of the mirror, so you can see your expressions and your presentation. After that, you should practice giving your speech to some friends. I can listen to it for you too. That's a great idea. I really owe you a big favour then. Sure. You can do my Latin homework for me. Just kidding. Seriously, don't worry about it. I can help you with anything you need. So when is the speech due? Well, the speech topic is due next Tuesday. The speech itself will be due next Friday. I can help you any time you want because I have no tests this next week. Besides, I'm an English major and Shakespeare is one of my favourite authors, so helping you out will be no big deal. Thanks so much. Well, I'm going to the library to get started on all this. I'll call you tomorrow. See you tomorrow then. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on MSG. First, you have some time to read questions 32 to 41. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 32 to 41. You've probably noticed that MSG appears regularly among the ingredients of your favourite foods. But what is it? How long has it been used? How is it used? MSG, or monosodium glutamate, is a chemical commonly used to add flavour to salty or sour tasting foods. The average person knows almost nothing about it, but today MSG is found in everything from potato chips to soup. Its principal component is an amino acid called glutamic acid or glutamate. It was identified by Professor Kikune Aikida in 1908, but Eastern cooks have been using glutamate-rich seaweed as flavouring for more than 1,200 years. Glutamate is found in two forms. Bound glutamate, which is linked to other amino acids forming a protein molecule, and free glutamate, that has no link to protein. Only free glutamate is effective in enhancing the flavour of food. Foods often used for their flavouring qualities, such as tomatoes and mushrooms, have high levels of naturally occurring free glutamate. MSG is usually produced through fermentation of corn, sugar beets, or sugar cane. The finished product is a pure white crystal, which dissolves easily and blends well in many foods. Monosodium glutamate enhances the basic flavour of many foods. New studies also show that MSG elicits a unique taste that is known as umami in Japan and often described by Americans as a savoury, broth-like or meaty taste. 
Umami may be the fifth basic taste, beyond salty, sweet, sour, and bitter. As an integral part of cuisines around the world, this savoury taste is common to the bouillons of Europe, the oyster sauce of China, the soy and fish sauces of Southeast Asia, the pizza of Italy, and the chowders and stews of America. MSG helps bring out the best natural flavours in a variety of foods such as meat, poultry, seafood, and vegetables. While MSG harmonises well with salty and sour tastes, it contributes little or nothing to sweet or bitter foods. Results of taste panel studies indicate that a level of 0.1 to 0.8% MSG by weight in food provides optimum enhancement of the food's natural flavour. This is within the range of glutamate that naturally occurs in foods. Approximately one half teaspoon of MSG is an effective amount to enhance the flavour of a pound of meat or four to six servings of vegetables or soup. MSG is a self-limiting substance. Once the proper amount is used, adding more contributes little to food flavour. Overuse of MSG, as with many other seasonings and spices, may cause some foods to have an undesirable taste. There is simply no substitute for wholesome, quality food and good cooking techniques. MSG makes good quality food taste better, but will not improve the flavour of poor quality food. Disturbingly, scientists have known since the 1960s that MSG kills brain cells in young animals. Further research suggested that MSG may also be responsible for ailments ranging from skin rashes to irregular heartbeat and depression. Reports vary on just what percentage of the population is sensitive to MSG. One researcher put the figure as high as 30%, but food industry-sponsored studies have suggested it as low as 1-2%. to Baby food manufacturers agreed to take MSG out of their products in the 1970s, but it is still widely used in other foods. This is because MSG is an economical way of stimulating great taste. If you're making a chicken stew but can't afford a whole chicken, why not use a little chicken and a lot of MSG? Consumer groups in the USA campaign regularly against its use, but for many of us, MSG will continue to be a part of everyday life. Food, it seems, will always be a matter of personal taste. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. End of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.